It's a delight to be here. Thank you very much. It's, this is my third city for the conference, and my head is swimming with all of the ideas and the themes that we've been discussing over these three days. Um, I recognize um, many of you as longtime uh, CTBUH conference members, and probably some of you have heard the um, 1.0, 2.0, and now this is 3.0. Uh, talk about super slender towers and ultra luxury towers in New York, but what I hope to do today is to put the slenderness phenomenon and typology, 21st century typology, into um, a context that will make distinctions between tall and slender uh, and tall and all and, and uh, I, I hope, ultimately, a historical context that will help us to be uh, more analytical, more critical uh, in our definitions, and I hope uh, have more useful conversations about what super tall is uh, and how we think about really defining skyscrapers, because I think this is all very relevant to the discussions that we've been having over these last few days about a um, about characters of place in a city, about the idea of vernacular uh, as a, uh, an expression of skyscraper design, a, a call by clients for a vernacularism. Well, what is that? What is the nature of place? And if I think here about uh, Hong Kong, which is my second favorite city after my own city of New York, and is certainly, uh, as we saw in the, the, the first session, uh, alternately the greatest skyscraper city with, with uh, Hong Kong and New York switching positions depending on what meter height you want to start counting. Uh, but these, these two cities in there, their similarities in vertical density, I think in their similarities in the way that they create energy and vitality out of their high-rise identities, out of their high-rise communities, is something that uh, lends itself as a lesson plan for the larger theme of the, of the conference, uh, in, intense vertical urbanism, cities and megacities. So um, I hope that the show and tell of New York skyscrapers and the super slender ultra, ultra luxury towers of which you see uh, 14 here, uh, 14 examples, which I will try to unpack for you in their characteristics of what I call the logic of luxury, uh, will be seen as uh, um, a, a description, an explanation of a particular typology and how it evolves, but not as an argument um, for ultra luxury, but as a way of getting more specific about thinking about what is the nature of place, how does uh, an, an urban condition, an urban character inform or be reflected in the skyline. And so the future skyline of New York in about five years uh, from now, if you're looking from the center of Central Park, is what you see here in a, um, a, a rendering uh, that uh, realizes uh, two towers that, that already exist. I, I won't name them, and I won't go into the specific heights of them, um, because what I want to do right now is, is simply preview where I'm going in the in the talk, in the brief talk, um, and then to uh, take you back and uh, and and. Uh, examine and uh, and un again unpack the characteristics of these particular of the logic the the development logic of these towers. Um, they're well known around the world because of the high prices that they have been gaining uh, for their penthouses, like the $90 million. There was another one in 157, which uh, is closed for almost $100 million. Or just last month, uh, the penthouse of 432 Park Avenue was sold, and these are. Uh, buildings that are over 400 meters tall for you to measure. I apologize, I'm accustomed to, to naming everything in feet, so I, um, when you ask me a question, I don't think I'll be able to do the calculations quickly enough. But I talk about these buildings um, not because of their extraordinary high prices. I don't want to defend ultra-luxury. I um, do want to recognize that some of the problems of these buildings have then created by the disparity, the larger, um, the, dispar the disparity of affluence uh, and the, of uh, 
inequality between incomes, of which these buildings then become a very <coughs> conspicuous example um, uh, for a political and, a, and social protest. So, so I think it is, um, uh, be, has become part of the rhetoric of these particular buildings. But again, uh, the Skyscraper Museum back in 2013, so four years ago before any of these buildings were constructed, uh, but where, when we were very aware that they were all on the horizon, popping above the horizon, uh, began to look at the designs and to gather together the renderings and to talk to the architects and engineers about how they were being built. And we did this exhibition called Sky High and the Logic of Luxury. And I would point you to the two previous papers that I wrote in order to explain these at much greater length um, in, for previous uh, CTBUH conferences. So this is a view of our small um, museum for those of you who haven't been there, 5,000 square feet. What I wanted to do in this conference, and obviously because we look out the windows here uh, at the verticalism of Hong Kong, is to, just to look at the phenomenon of the slender tower and the luxury tower and see how it was spreading around the world. So the sprawl of tall um, around the world. Um, of course, Hong Kong uh, is, has uh, invented this kind of high-rise living. Um, it has defined it, and if we look um, at any of these um, slides, uh, and we look out the windows, and I was looking on the, the bus from Guangzhou on the way in, it's just really extraordinary for, for anybody else from anywhere to see what is common uh, in Hong Kong. Um, the idea of slenderness, therefore, is, is, is nothing new to Hong Kong, but I would argue, and I am arguing, that the examples that you see here, like High Cliff and, and Summit, uh, that the pair of what previously before New York was the, uh, the most slender building in the world with a slenderness ratio of 1 to 20, um, is, was much touted at the time. Instructional engineers, of course, know about it, but it's a, it's a building that was a prototype without any progeny. There, was, there, there weren't 14 more of the, these ultra-luxury towers in Hong Kong. So um, I'm arguing for a, a different kind of specificity about the definitions of tall and slender. Uh, and there are, of course, many other places in the world that are beginning to uh, multiply their tall and slender towers. And obviously, we think of Dubai with the world's tallest and densest block here, all of residential towers. And of course, I'm speaking only of residential buildings here. Uh, but they're spreading, too, to other cities. And I had the great pleasure to uh, do a speaking tour uh, for CTVUH chapters in Australia. Uh, and so I visited uh, Brisbane and Melbourne and also Sydney. But Brisbane and Melbourne are the two places where slender towers are now also beginning um, to proliferate, as you can see in the Melbourne examples here. Uh, so what we did at the Skyscraper Museum, because we've done exhibitions on super tall and we've done this uh, slenderness uh, analysis and, and exhibition, is to think about what is the distinction between the New York type um, and the, tall, the super tall thin towers or slim towers that you see elsewhere. And so I want to, uh, to distinguish in this definition between the Super, super slender of New York, um, and this, uh, what we call it the simply slender. Uh, I call it for New York, I call it the singularly slender towers. Um, the others that you see around the world, and we lined up all of the buildings that were uh, super tall by CTBUH definitions of 300 meters or taller. These are all of them in the world um, that would qualify. And you see them color coded so that all the blue ones are from Dubai. Uh, the um, the um, purple ones are New York, and you can see they're um, exceptional. The, the lighter blue Abu Dhabi, the one uh, green one uh, uh, projected for Toronto, and uh, in India, the other, two, the other two in red. And I think you can see, um, if your uh, eyes uh, don't distort, that there is something different about the New York Towers. They are much more slender than the others. So I want to make the distinction very clear that there is a difference between um, between talls uh, and, uh, and big, 
right? So one of the clearest separate the distinctions would be between the, world, the original World Trade Center and the new 432 Park Avenue, which is a little bit taller than the original World Trade Center and also the roof of the new One World Trade Center. So a, res a purely residential building that's um, 425 meters tall, um, but is on a, a footprint, uh, I'll show you, hope you don't mind, 93 feet uh, square. So there's a difference between, between tall and big, and um, much of what I'm saying is uh, a, a little bit of a, a, a needle in the side or a you know, knife in the, in the side of the CTBUH focus on vertical height and a rather obsessive uh, uh, calc uh, data database uh, recording of vertical heights specifically and sometimes exclusively, I would say, arguing in the analysis, and a plea to think about the other dimensions of buildings, in particular square foot, foot area or gross floor area, because in commercial architecture, it's area that's, that matters. Okay. So um, what we also did was to put together the New York towers that are super slender. So this is just a preview before I, before I take apart the the uh, development strategy and the, the logic of luxury so that you see the whole span of some 14 towers from a 600 foot tower to a 1500 foot tower all essentially residential the tallest one central park apartments uh, is a, a mixed use building with some um, commercial and retail in the base and a hotel but most of these are exclusively residential buildings so it's important to make the distinction um, between tall and super tall uh, for, um, uh, for the terminology that is adopted to clarify to the public uh, and to make, uh, m make uh, more articulate for the press uh, uh, something which becomes blended together far too much when, you're, when you just apply the word super tall to, um, to these towers. Uh, as you saw in the last slide, some of them are really not super tall at all. They're only 600 feet or so, or 200, um, 200 meters tall. Um, but there is, as we were just discussing in the previous session, uh, a backlash now, in, certainly in places like New York, uh, London, where some towers are growing but are mostly constrained by height limits. Uh, and um, in Hong Kong, we were just hearing, there's a lot of civic engagement and, and a lot of opposition to uh, additional new tall towers. Uh, and we, we experienced this in New York, uh, a five-part series in the New York Times that, was, uh, that confused the idea of new skyscrapers and, um, and foreign wealth and money laundering, which really doesn't have anything to do with skyscrapers at all. It also happens in shorter buildings and in Beverly Hills and lots of other places. But somehow, the skyscrapers became the, kind of in, the vessel for the animus of the New York Times in an extended uh, series, and um, you see it also in uh, in critical uh, um, examinations, in uh, in reviews, and uh, in this issue of the Architectural Record, a uh, commercial magazine, but nevertheless, architecture and money was kind of taken apart, um, especially in an article by Michael Sorkin uh, called "Too Rich and, and Too Skinny," which. Uh, uh, voiced his uh, offense at the uh, at the representation of inequality that is so exemplified by these towers, and indeed um, they are. Uh, they do exemplify that. A hundred million dollars is a lot of money. Uh, uh, per square foot, I hope you don't mind, uh, the sales price of most of these towers is now about five or $6,000 a square foot and goes up to $10,000 a, a square foot. So by square meter, just multiply by 10, by 10 or 11. So um, this is not, uh, this is certainly not housing for the masses. And there's an enormous amount of resentment as we think of London uh, being comparable. Uh, to the uh, kind of zombie urbanism complaint of people who move into townhouses and then depopulate entire neighborhoods. Well, in New York, the uh, billionaire's row of 57th Street ha uh, and the new towers that will um, populate it uh, are very much the focus of analysis of sh uh, shadow studies, and this shows how uh, Central Park will be taken over by, um, by shadows of this kind of 
picket fence of tall towers. Um, an exaggeration, I think, but one which has really engaged the public imagination and an enormous amount of negativity about these buildings. Uh, so here they are again, and I won't go through them uh, all individually and by name, but I think you can see in the representations that they show a very wide range of stylistic responses. Some are um, stone-faced, rather uh, conservative, uh, either classicism or kind of gothic, neo-gothic identity. Others are glassy towers. There are others who are quite inventive in their formal um, arrangements. Uh, um, some, some very sleek and, and uh, indistinguishable from uh, an office building type, except for their slenderness. So there's a, a very wide range. Um, they uh, tend to uh, cluster along 57th Street. This is a map that we made for the Sky High exhibition, and you can see it on our, our website where that whole show is in a virtual exhibit. Uh, and you can see them uh, along that axis and through Midtown where they were uh, encouraged by uh, a more liberal zoning law but, um, but have as their raison d'etre the view of Central Park. This is the reason for these towers. Uh, their commanding views, their trophy views uh, in the rendering that you see here um, or from a, a hard hat tour of the uh, penthouse space um, that I was um, fortunate enough to, to have at 157. And this is um, the view of uh, not just of Central Park but of the horizon in three dimensions. So high above a thousand feet uh, above Central Park. Um, it's uh, it's views like this uh, where views have value that define the trophy character. Uh, and 57th Street isn't the only place that you'll find these towers. This is the Herzog and de Moron 56 Leonard, which is downtown in Tribeca, a more traditional neighborhood, but this building has escaped um, its historic uh, landmark district and, and uh, stacks these villas uh, in the sky. And there the sweeping views are of the uh, Hudson River, of the East River, and New York Harbor, so they're just as spectacular as Central Park, and they, but they attract a different kind of um, clientele. Uh, 432 Park Avenue, we've seen a few times, and it, it rises to uh, 425 meters and uh, lifts itself some 96 stories uh, above the city. And on the top floor of uh, these apartments, you have a, a full floor space of about 8,000 square feet, and there are four views um, to show you, to attract you to the 10 square foot re uh, windows that look endlessly out um, in um, the four uh, compass points uh, of New York. Uh, and uh, I think you can see from the advertisement of 111 West 57th Street, which is the most slender building of any of the ones that are now uh, in develop, well, I I in construction, in fact. Uh, this one will take the title away from High Cliff. Uh, it's a 1 to 23 ratio. And uh, as uh, you can see, they emphasize the the, the, the center point, they don't show any of their competitors, by the way, in the rendering, but, so th but this one rises high um, above all of the others in order to get the clear views uh, north and, um, sorry about that, north and, and south in particular because the building is so narrow that it has to have concrete shear walls on either side, so there's no looking, uh, no looking east and west. Um, I'll show you more of this uh, building later because the floor plate of it uh, is only about 2,500 square feet. Uh, it's an extraordinarily small um, lot that it's squeezed into, uh, you know, even in Hong Kong terms, I'd have to say. Uh, but the thing that I wanted to uh, explain in particular about these New York super singularly slender and ultra-luxury towers is the condition of New York that has created them, because they are absolutely characteristic of the New York conditions. And um, that particular, the most important condition that we have since 1961 in New York is a zoning law that constrains uh, the amount of development that's allowed on a lot um, by, by a floor area ratio, so that every lot gets a, a certain amount of square feet. Um, but these buildings get taller by buying the undeveloped air rights adjacent um, to them. And I'm sure that you're all familiar with this, this uh, concept. 
uh, and practice. Uh, so taking uh, the finite amount of, oh dear, five minutes, uh, finite amount of FAR and piling um, uh, piling those unused air rights, leaving them open forever, but piling them high in the sky so that the eyeballs are high, um, uh, lifted as high as possible into the air. And so this Jean Nouvel design for the MoMA Tower, the Museum of Modern Arts Tower, it's called 53 West 53rd Street now, shows you um, on the one side, the short side, what was allowed on the site by the existing FAR and how they stretched it by building air rights um, into a tower that was, it was going to be 1,250 feet, but the planning department cut it down to uh, 1,050 feet, and they were able to do that um, uh, because the building was not as of right. It had to go to the Planning Commission. Um, but this building uh, did buy air rights, 432 Park, but it is built as of right. It didn't need to go through any public review process, and this also is the essential character of New York and allows for these very slender towers. Now, since I have so little time, I direct you to the other two uh, articles that I've written on this that really goes into the detail about the, about FAR and about the strategies of slabs. But I think you can see how the openness that's, uh, that previously existed on the site and we in a model that we made at the Skyscraper Museum in order to show um, in color how the low space could be piled up on top of the tower in order to transfer the air rights onto that one small um, uh, square. Um, you can see that, um, that there is a um, a, a reshaping of the uh, of the ta of the urban fabric through making open spaces and piling them um, densely onto one spot, uh, and I won't don't have time to go into this, but a full floor plan like you see at 432 Park Avenue takes advantage of the idea of exclusivity, where you walk out of the elevator um, directly into your space, and so. All of the space is being purchased by the buyer and is not on the ticket of the developer for the um, communal spaces, the corridors, and all of that. Um, uh, so exclusivity comes together in the use of the slenderness strategy, where at one unit per floor, you, won't, you need far fewer elevators than you do in a major, in, into a larger tower. And that's the point that I want to make about Dubai and all of the other places, that it, um, if, uh, if, Ultra luxury is, uh, in New York is couture. All of the other places in the world are, um, are, are uh, net a porte. They're, they're ready to wear, right? They're, um, they're, they're for a much more mass market. Um, and that's the case in Dubai, and you can see that in the plan. The plan uh, uh, that has t about, I think, 10 apartments per floor, and if we contrast that at scale for the Princess Tower, which is the same height as 432 Park Avenue, you can see how many more units are packed um, into a only slightly larger floor plate. And the same thing is true if we look across all of the Dubai uh, um, slender towers that have anywhere from 300 to 600 units per building. Not 100 units, not, not 84 units, but 600 units. Um, and if we look at um, Australia and uh, the um, Melbourne towers, uh, we can see, uh, I was talking to um, Carl Fender earlier about the one on the far left, the Australia 108, that has 1,100 units in it. 1,100, not 100 units, same height as the New York towers, but, ele but 10 times the number of units, um, which you can see in some charts that we made and have many more of those. So. Um, uh, the same thing is true in uh, Brisbane, where there are many 80-story towers. And one minute, thank you. Um, and so I recall, um, in, now that we've had a little bit more analysis, the differences between the towers in these different places. So um, let me conclude by making the argument um, that a little more historical, and uh, looking at it from the current exhibition at the Skyscraper Museum, which is called 10 and Taller. It's all the buildings in New York City, 252 of them, that were 10 stories or taller from the very first one in 1874 until 1900. So the move from masonry to steel, to the triumph of, of steel skeleton construction. 
And um, what we did is, we, in that map in the center, we mapped them all. We had some, we had wonderful data from uh, structural engineer Donald Friedman. Um, and then we, we, so we mapped them on a, on a land map. We made that grid that you saw on the wall where you can see every single one of the 250 of them in a historical photograph. Um, and then um, I think it, merits a, a, some attention um, and explanation. We put them on a chart by year that shows you uh, the use, uh, the year in the, and the, the, the use year and the height. And um, you can see from the very first ones, the red ones are office buildings, the blue ones are apartments, the dark blue ones are hotels, and the yellow ones are lofts. And um, you can see that they're scarce at the beginning, but nevertheless, the first tall buildings with its tower, the um, Tribune Tower, uh, remained uh, one of the tallest buildings in the, in the city for, for 16 years. Um, and, but, and you can see when the new tallest ones to, uh, begin to be introduced in the 1890s. Um, but I would, uh, I would make the point that if we focus only on these, on only the tall ones, rather than the all ones, so tall versus all, that we're making a gigantic error in our analysis of buildings. To look only at these tells you practically nothing about cities or megacities or phenomenon or use um, or floor area or commercial values. To look at this tells you about cities and urban development and economic development. So I would encourage um, the CTBUH to think more about floor area and less about vertical height and bring a much fuller analysis to the urban condition, um, the urban economic um, and um, the urban psychology <laughs> that, we all, that we all identify with. Thank you.